It all began in 1973, when 17 intrepid crews headed out from the historical harbor of Portsmouth to take a giant leap into the unknown as the Whitbread Round the World race was born. Ahead of them lay an epic adventure, an adventure that would provide triumph for some and disaster and heartbreak for others, the vital ingredients for a challenge that would capture the imagination for decades to come. As the years rolled by, the race evolved and the emphasis shifted from pure adventure to professional racing. And by the dawn of the new millennium, the Volvo Ocean Race enticed the world's finest sailors aboard state-of-the-art, sleek carbon fiber racing machines. The class of 2011 boasts a wealth of diverse experience, from Olympic gold medalists and America's Cup legends to those sailors who have made the Volvo Ocean Race their own. For this edition's six-boat fleet, the race is further, faster, and harder than ever before, and it's billed as potentially the most closely contested race in the history of the event. The opening leg, the first of nine, takes the boats from their home port of Alicante to Cape Town, following a traditional trade route, seeking out trade winds and crossing the doldrums. The crowds flock to the race village for the traditional curtain raiser of the import race. Despite light and fickle conditions, it was Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing that laid down the gauntlet. An immense 14-minute victory, perhaps a sign of things to come. Just a week later, the fleet made ready to begin their adventure. His Royal Highness Prince Felipe was on hand to start proceedings as family and friends bade their loved ones a fond farewell. of the import course and it was time to head for the high seas. Camper with Emirates Team New Zealand led the way, with Puma Ocean Racing powered by Berg and Home Hope Telefonica hard on their sterns. Really happy to get going. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you're nervous. I was not nervous at all, just excited to get out there. We've been uh, working on this for a long time now and uh, this is a really enjoyable leg in these boats, so uh, it's good. This is uh, very emotional. It's, uh, it's all very beautiful. The course here is very intense. It's quite short considering the win we've got. Well, we've lost a place. We're third now. But we're still happy. Ahead of us over there is Puma. And over there behind us are Kampa and Abu Dhabi. But, you know, it's all good. Let the party begin. Team Sanya, the only refitted boat in the fleet, had a tough import lap, lagging behind by more than seven minutes at the leaving mark. But morale was still high. It's a long way to go, we didn't do any damage. And um, far from a bit of a, to our egos. And now we're off, 20, 22 knots. Cape Town, here we come. The fleet in sight of each other knuckled down to what was inevitably going to be a tough night. But little did Team Sanya know just what lay ahead of them, in particular for Bauman, Andy Mickeljohn. It was a very tricky night. We sailed into the lee of a big cliff and next minute, you know, we're side by side with Puma in the most hideous sea state um, with four or five knots of wind. We knew the breeze was about 500 meters away. We said as soon as we hit 20 knots, we're going to go from the J2 jib back to the to the number four, the heavy weather jib. And by the time we'd started the change in 19 knots, by the time we were halfway through it, we had 38 knots. So it had built that quickly. We just came out of this huge wave, and basically there was nothing underneath it. And um, you know, the bow of the boat probably fell five or six meters and um, and Andy twisted his ankle badly, rotated his ankle badly and on landing and, and, and broke it. I was obviously very sorry at, at, at what we'd done to one of our guys, um, but he was safe. Um, he had good circulation in his foot. Um, he was strapped in a bunk, he was on 
great painkillers. Um, he was stayed really the focus at that stage. You know, the rest of us had our hands very full just to get the boat and the equip, you know, the equipment and the people through the rest of the through the rest of the storm, so to speak. The challenging conditions continued unabated. Tough enough with a full crew, almost impossible a man down. But Sanya wasn't the only team having difficulties. We were very much of a mind that this is going to be a very long, hard night ahead of us. We weren't so much in the mode that this is a hard night right now. It was going to get worse. Rigs bust in two places. Cape Town's a long way away right now. We just fell down a hole in the sea, and when we came off the back of a wave, the boat fell. It was pretty much weightless feeling. We landed, uh, landed at the bottom of the wave, and, and obviously all the rigging loads up when you do that. And uh, something let go, and there was a loud bang, and the boat went from 22 degrees heel one way to 20 degrees the other way because of the swing keel in less than two seconds. So had anybody been standing up on the windward side, for sure they would have been thrown over the side. I guess the first feeling was disbelief. How could this have happened? Uh, how could this have happened so quickly? How, you know, just total and utter disbelief and then an empty feeling. Choppy, um, probably a two to three meter sea state, um, and very quickly the, the boat swings round so the mast is facing to windward, um, and we couldn't get the sails on board because there are locks at the top of the mast. So we needed either to get somebody out to the locks to cut the sails away, or we needed to get the mast closer to us. As soon as we tried to winch the mast closer to us, then spreaders and, and bits of the mast were basically puncturing holes in the side of the boat. Uh, yeah, it's pretty deep. 500 mil after the trailer. So, um, you know, we had a, we had a period where we, we realised we were under control, but we realised we were going to have to take some risk in order to get everything back and be able to motor back to Alicante. I might slip down the mainsail and pick up the lock on the third, third reef. We might be able to pop it off the lock. Yeah, it is a neutral bump. Yeah. How about some lights, boys? Okay, here we go. Yeah, yeah we're we're light. Foolish, probably in hindsight. It's pretty rough. Once we stabilise the situation, everything starts going through your mind. What do we do now? Where's the spare mast? How, how long is it going to take to do it? Is it? Are we out of the leg? How do we catch up? How do we get to get? You know, a million things go through your mind, and, and obviously you've got to communicate with the race office, communicate with your shore team, get them in, into action. We've, we've got some damage to the sails, obviously. <laughs> Mates, mates have got a few holes in it. And uh, there's, a, there's like a fist size hole which is spread and made in the back of the boat, side of the boat. An incident packed first night, but the drama wasn't over yet. Back with Team Sanya, all was not as it should be. I went downstairs, had a chat with Axel, the navigator. Um, to look at whether we should tack back in shore to take advantage of a shift which we were expecting later in the afternoon. And next minute it felt like we'd just run into thick mud, you know, and um, at the same time, big shout from on deck, you know, check the bow, check the bow, feels like we've got a lot of water on board.
time it's really easy for the boat to pretty much tear itself apart. It's suddenly a whole lot heavier than it's supposed to be. Quite clearly we've got an opening which wants to tear further. Um, and, you know, we had a pretty good idea that, you know, the damage was contained just in front of the watertight bulkhead. Now, if the bulkhead had collapsed due to too much water pressure or, or, the, or the damage had spread on the aft side of the bulkhead, I was very confident that we were going to sink. Is it just me or are we feel a little bow down again? First and foremost, we had to make sure the guys were safe. We had Andy in a bunk with a broken leg. So we got him into a survival suit, got the guys out of their bunks into life jackets. We sort of got the pumps ready. We, you know, we, we pretty much almost got ready in case we had to abandon ship quickly. I've got no idea how bad it is. I've got no idea how bad it is until we get it in. So we'll, we'll just get it want to think the legs over at that stage. All, all you're thinking about is, is getting the boat and the crew and everything safely back to the dock so that you can, as quickly as possible, just sort of establish how much trouble you're in. You know, you hope that there's a quick fix, you know, we were talking about whether, you know, we could put enough weight in the boat to, to repair a small hole if we just had a small puncture wound or something. So eventually we looked over the side once we were on the other tack and we could see that, uh, yeah, our leg was, was, was over. The situation was clear for Sanya, but Abu Dhabi, motoring back to a blowy Alicante, was determined to ensure that their setback was purely temporary. Uh, early evening, got a phone call from Jules on the boat. The rig had fallen off, then we swung into our crisis plan at this end, so we pulled together our key team members, um, met at the Volvo HQ. We dispatched our uh, short team to Madrid last night where the rig was being shipped actually to Rotterdam. So it's, it's been 180. We've had special permissions from the Spanish government to truck on a Sunday. We've got 20, 20 odd people here um, dismantling or unpacking and trying to get the base set up so that we can use all our equipment and get the boat. We need rigging container up and running. We need sail making up and running. We need boat building up and running. We've got to figure out what happened. We have a great bunch of guys and girls here. And the mood is sort of defiance. There would be nobody more determined than us to try and get the uh, get show back on the road. The sailors, we're all just gutted, but I think, um, you know, everyone's just relieved nobody's hurt. These are dangerous boats. This has always been a dangerous race, and, uh, and we've just been reminded of it. The guys I feel for really are the shore crew. You know, they've just packed up the base, taken the rib out of the water, dismantled the cradle, taken the sail off down, and they've just spent the last 12 hours trying to rebuild it all so that we can make repairs. Sure, we're down right now, but, but we're not out. Um, we could rejoin this leg. We haven't retired from this leg. We suspended racing. My ambition is to carry on, sail to Cape Town, and, and then, uh, you know, who knows? We might even overtake some of the boats if the weather goes in our way. But, it's tough, you know, when you put so much work into something and uh, it's just, uh, you know, one week ago we won the import race, top of the world, this week we're not. Maybe next week we'll be back up again. News of their competitors' misfortune spread quickly amongst the fleet, but for the remaining four boats, throttling back in the testing conditions simply wasn't an option. It's very hard to slow down when you're in the middle of a race because there aren't two ways to steer a boat. And when you try to slow down, sometimes it's worse for the structure as sometimes it doesn't go so well with the waves. So we were forced to keep the same frame of mind and we still want to win the race. As long as we're not behind and the finish is up ahead, we're forced to keep pushing the boat. Throughout that next day was, you know, I guess a fairly uncomfortable type of day. You know, we were in 30 to 40 knots, sort of out the middle of the med, sort of approaching Gibraltar, and um, we stuck it out there a bit further than the other guys, and there was a nice shift towards the end. We had a nice lead um, coming into Gibraltar. We 
firmly believes whoever got out of Gibraltar first may get a break. So we had the hammer down. So we've had a pretty tough first sort of 36 hours of this race. We've seen up to 40, 40 plus knots on the wind. Now our final approach to uh, Straits of Gibraltar, it's moderating. We're down to just under 20 knots at the moment. It'll be quite a frenzy over the next few hours just to get through here. As Camper led the fleet through the bottleneck of the Gibraltar Straits, all hoping for some welcome respite from the Tempest, Team Sanya had pulled into the port of Matril in order to assess just how bad the damage to their boat actually was. As you come in here, you can see the true extent of the damage. That is the Mediterranean through there. Um, it's pretty, pretty scary stuff, I can tell you. Uh, I don't know if I should really go up there and walk on that because you could fall through. And all that's between us and the outside of the boat there is uh, about two millimetres of carbon fibre and you can see all the strands and the edges of it all smashed off. Once we did a plan, the critical items on the timeline popped their heads up quite quickly. And quite clearly the quickest thing we actually needed to do was get the boat on a ship on its way to Cape Town because that's what we were going to be waiting for at the end of the day. This logistical set, like you wouldn't believe, is ships, trains, planes, you name it. So at the moment the guys have been going through a process of trying to secure shipping first up and then it sort of leads back from there. So where can we get a ship to? Can we get it to pick it up in here? Do we need to go to Lisbon? How much is the ships going to cost? You know, they range in, from anything from 100,000 euros to 300,000 euros. The most likely scenario is that we'll be pulling the boat here, strip it down, which is what the shore crew are working on now. It'll be put on a flatbed and trucked to Lisbon where it'll be loaded on a ship, shipped to Cape Town. As soon as the boat arrives in Cape Town, it'll be lifted up and put into a sort of custom-built container where we'll cut the old section of the bow out and put the new section in. It's a bit of work. <laughs> Big job. Do you expect to see it like that, bro? No. Never seen anything like this before in my life. Amazing, these guys didn't sink. Not a lot. <laughs> to fix it, we have to um, build a whole new bow section which is uh, probably about four metres long um, to, to basically get all the DLAM out of there now that all the damage created after the impact or whatever happened, which we're unsure of. Um, so our race now is actually against time. Team Sanya's leg may have been over, but Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing was desperately trying to salvage theirs. Once their spare mast was back in Alicante, Heroics from a determined shore crew ensured that the Falcon was ready to fly remarkably quickly. The team motored back to the point where they had suspended racing, ready to continue their Volvo Ocean race journey. It's good to be back out on the water and uh, thanks so much to all the guys that uh, made it all happen over the last few days. So. That's great, but uh, you know we have got a new mast, and uh, you can't help but uh, think that, you, by preference, you wouldn't be setting off on six and a half thousand miles with a brand new mast. So we need to take this easy over the next couple of days, have a look at it before we uh, get too committed. After the muscle flexing of the first few days, it was time for some serious strategizing amongst the Volvo Ocean Race fleet. Light, fickle conditions were giving the navigators a headache as they studied the weather and debated which route to take across the Atlantic. It was decision time. Unfortunately, by the time we got out here, because it took so long to get out of the map, the uh, trade winds pretty much evaporated. We have a uh, camper about oh, five or so miles of beam to leeward. Um, we have Telefonica about three miles just below our bow in front of us. And uh, Group Bomb, I think, is about 25 miles just uh, behind into Lourdes, down to the south. We've got to try to get through tonight, get into this uh, prefrontal southerly that's hopefully going to be here in about six hours or so, and uh, at least we get to go sailing again. So, not too exciting right now, but um, I'm sure there'll be plenty more to report. Yeah, can I ever try and run the trades down the African coast um, and get to the west at a later point in time, so you take these 
beautiful gains because you're heading, you're heading to where you need to go straight away. Or you take the westerly option and just take loss after loss after loss to anyone who is in on the coast. And then eventually you get you get you start heading south and you take your gains later in the piece. La situación táctica después de the tactical situation after the Straits of Gibraltar was very difficult. Prior to the start in Alicante, our weather team, which helped us plot the route, they didn't have a clear option, so it was a 50-50 choice. We are going west. That's what the captain always says. West is best. West is best. The two options had been worked out, and at that moment we had the choice of either of those two options, because the gaps between them at the finish were really small. But the option that we chose was certainly the best option. It was projected two to three days from then. That's to say in the short term. We knew we'd be ahead of the fleet because of the trade winds which allowed us to head towards the target as quickly as possible. We do a lot of research on these sorts of things before we leave and we run years and years of simulations and it had looked before we left as if that you could get underneath the high pressure system, you could slip down inside the Canaries and get through the trades on the other side. There, a westerly option always existed but the balance seemed to be that it was going to be an awful long way, you had to go far further west than you would normally go. So we all wiggled our way down to the southwest, no one really um, having committed one way or the other. And there was a bit of ambivalence in, in the models, but we're doing two knots and the wind's fitful coming from different directions. There comes a point where you can't sort of sit in the middle, you've got to go one way or the other and we had the breeze come out of a direction that was, we could either go northwest or southeast and southeast was to the, um, towards the African coast where in a situation where there was very little wind, you were going to get land, some sort of land sea breeze effects once you got there and then roll along. At that point in time, we saw Camper trying to take the same option as us. I think we were already in different conditions with different winds. At that point, the high pressure ridge had already separated the two sections of the fleet. Camper was a bit in the centre of the ridge and we were near the trade winds near the African coast. The others were already on the other side and Camper was in the middle. And then you keep looking at the models, analysing them to death, and we're not quite getting fast enough that we're going to get down and get the benefit of the, um, the land-sea breeze interactions when we need to. And it's like, maybe we're going to have to bite the bullet here. Then we've got another model run in and on proper analysis of it, what it showed was that in five days' time the trade winds were not going to be there. And that meant that if you were in the east, the time when you needed to be benefiting, you weren't going to benefit. So having made one decision, I then had to go on deck and say, look, you know what, that decision was a bad decision. <laughs> we're now going to have to make a different decision, which is to go west. We're going to fall in behind everyone else. All those hard one miles we did over the last six hours are basically out the window. But it looks like it's what we have to do. We've got a lot to catch up. The guys are sort of 40 miles in front. When we were parked up last night, they were out here moving west, so um, a lot to do, actually. Not happy. After that, the situation was very comfortable. Only Group Armour decided to go to the east. We went west and led that group. It was a difficult decision to make, but finally it proved to be right. It would have been less comfortable if we were the only boat that went west and the others went east. We would have been much more nervous if that had happened. So decisions made. Group Armour alone committed to the southern route, hugging the African coast, whilst Puma and Telefonica decided that West was best. Campers' indecision meant that they eventually turned right, but significantly adrift of the other two boats. Which call would be right remained to be seen. This 
The boat's lack of significant progress was good news for a resurgent Abu Dhabi, by now sailing as hard as possible for Gibraltar. to be a false dawn for the Emirati team. Unsympathetic weather gods and the fast rig turnaround in Alicante was preying on the crew's minds. This is faced with a pretty difficult decision here, so trying to involve the whole group. Um, essentially, we're, we are wounded. We, the rigging isn't 100% on the spare mast. We've ultrasounded it. And we have to stop. Hi, Matt. Tell me about your thoughts on what we're going through. Oh, it's obviously pretty hard. No one signs up to do a round the world race and don't want to get around the world. That's first of all. Second of all, I guess it's, out of all the leagues, this is you know, one of the better ones. Pretty cool leagues. It's probably the lesser of two evil. We've gone from a position where we thought we had a, you know, something which we tried and tested over, over the last year and were confident with. We've now, you know, that's been sort of taken away from us. A gutsy but heartbreaking decision from the Abu Dhabi crew, deciding that discretion was the better part of valor. Time to turn the boat around and retire from leg one. Group Armour's southerly course was providing the predicted early gains, and initially there was plenty of joie de vivre on board. For the crew, we were pretty happy with ourselves since we had 140 miles lead. I think it was probably a record for the biggest distance between the first and the second in a Volvo Ocean race. Afterwards, it was probably also a record for the biggest loss in two days. But I think everyone was ready for it because the navigator and I explained what was happening. I didn't withhold anything from the crew. We knew that we were heading off that way, taking an option which we believed in, and if it worked, it would be the jackpot. It was really exciting to have been the only ones to have chosen that option because we believed in it. But I think that they're all guys with experience and they know these things can happen. It's true that the options that you take at sea are key to the race and you have to have confidence in what you're doing. But sometimes that's the game. from you know day three onwards was an opportunity to get back into the, the race you know you're pushing as hard as you can you're in different weather you have very little to gauge your own performance by The battle with Puma was very interesting and plenty of fun. But it was also a great opportunity for us to find out more about our boat and improve our performance. We were very close all the time, knowing that both boats are similar and do similar speeds. We were fighting all the time. First we were in the lead. After that, they passed us. We overtook them again later. It was very hard, but at the same time very good for us, because it helped us to know more about our performance. And I guess it was the same for them. Well, we've got a full battle, a battle royale with Puma. Um, 
they're no longer in sight, but their distance away from us is very, um, very small in terms of how close we are to the mark. So, yeah, we're fighting with them. We hope we get slightly better weather than they do. Um, we've got to push the boat hard. You can feel the boat being pushed hard now, even though there's not much wind. We're well heeled over. Um, we're fighting hard for every inch we can get. We're waiting for a shift. Next. We've come a long way away <laughs> from the mark to get this ship. Um, it, it's a little bit less abrupt that the low, the low is not quite as severe as it was before. We're just getting the tail end of the front, but it, there is a shift out here for us. And uh, so we plan to get it and tack and then start sailing fast at, uh, at Fernando, on well, the doldrums. But, uh, yep, so soon we get to spend our chips. Where are we, Bubsy? We're in the commercial port, I suppose, Lisbon, Portugal. The main's coming off now, the rig will get ready to get pulled out at 6.30 a.m. I think the crane is here in the morning, so we've got 24 hours basically now to get ready to get on the ship. They may have retired from leg one, but there was certainly no rest for Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing. The priority for the crew was to get their yacht safely onto a container ship and heading for Cape Town as fast as possible. Since the more time they could claw back to tune up their replacement rig, the better. It was a case of all hands on deck. Sure, I'm more nerve cell in Cape Town. Um, well, it's um, 11 o'clock at night. Um, we're just about to move the boat the final three or four inches onto its cradle. Ah, wouldn't like to do that. <laughs> Too many times. Falcon has landed. Uh, Ken Reed reporting from just before the equator. We have, uh, I'm going to be the videographer today for a ceremony. We've been told that King Neptune is coming aboard. Who is not worthy of the southern seas? Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? I am Captain Neptune. <laughs> Say my name. Hey, 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 hey. King Neptune has been woken from a deep sleep, which he does not like. I've heard that you've been hiding in the bow using the underage. Oh, oh yeah, douse that man. Douse him. Douse him. With the equator crossing antics done and dusted, the fleet's focus returned to the only waypoint of leg one, the archipelago of Fernando de Noronha. And still there was little separating Puma and Telefonica. First blood to Puma Ocean Racing powered by Berg, but their delight was short-lived. A small but significant error from the Americans allowed the Spaniards to take the lead. Overtaking Puma was a great feeling because we'd been fighting for that for several days and it was very hard to achieve. It was pure speed. And, due to the similarity of the boats, it was very difficult to achieve. 
We took advantage the very first time that we could. They made a small mistake and we overtook them. We were very happy on board because we were quite close to the finish. We were in the last week of the leg and to be in the lead at that time was great for us. Being the leader of the fleet in the last week of the leg it's not the same as being second and thinking that you only have one week to catch them. The big cat was shadowing every move that Telefonica made, but there were tricky conditions for both as the St. Helena High blocked the quickest route to Cape Town. Struggling to get around this wide air patch to lure it. Uh, the breeze is a little lighter than what we expected already. So we just peeled to a bigger sail because we had a big lift. And um, we've got Telefonica out here. I'm just seeing if we can cut the corner a little bit and get stuff before them. We had a bad day yesterday, so um, hoping to gain some back at some point would be nice. But um, it's looking like we're going to have quite a race coming on with plenty of breeze between here and Cape Town, so it could be good. On the other side of the high, a cold front and a mad dash towards South Africa. Patience was a virtue that would be royally rewarded. But the Volvo Ocean race is anything but plain sailing. of breeze, reef, jib, staysail, and, uh, and the mast fell over the side. And then some clear heroics from the crew. Uh, you know, Casey knowing full well that I wouldn't let him jump in the water to cut the mainsail free to try to save the mainsail, just jumped in without asking my permission. <laughs> and the bottom line is our leg's over. Uh, we're still 2,300 miles away from Cape Town. We are under jury rig heading that way. We're assessing all our options. And to say that we're disappointed uh, would be the understatement of the century. Okay, day 16 we're on now. I guess we're into day 17. Reaching our way in the South Atlantic. Uh, had some nice conditions, got some good speeds, but we just had some shocking news that uh, Puma's just uh, lost their rig, which um, is very sad for them. Um, I feel very sorry for them. I know how they feel. It's not a very great. So let's hope they get there in a good time and get ready for the next leg. But uh, for us, yeah, we just got to work our way around this high and beat Camper in now, who are 160 miles behind. So hopefully uh, we don't have to push it too hard, don't have to break anything ourselves and uh, get in there. Well, when we heard about Puma's dismasting, it felt like being doused with a bucket of cold water. We'd spent 15 days racing against them, 15 days and 15 nights. It made us feel bad. It made us feel really bad. But we also felt bad from a sporting point of view, because they were going to lose the leg. They'd lost a mast in a place that was pretty dangerous. There was confusion. So those are the reasons that we were unhappy that they'd broken their mast. We were really worried about them. It was a different situation than when the other boats had broken their masts early in the race. This one affected us more. We didn't feel good about this one. It was a bad place to break the mast, and we thought about stopping and helping them because it was the Southern Atlantic, which is incredibly dangerous. So, 
We were in a bad place, worrying about them and their problem. And we would have wanted to help them more. But in the end, we had to follow our own path and leave the boat. It wasn't a pleasant experience. With Telefonica steaming almost unopposed towards Table Mountain, it was Campus' turn to enjoy the epic conditions. One thing in ocean racing you discover very quickly when you get hurt is just how, how vulnerable and how far away from help you are. The closest landfall for the wounded Puma was Tristan de Cunha, but in order to get there they needed diesel and fast. The support team sprung into action, diverting the container ship Zim Monaco towards the stricken yacht to deliver somewhat unceremoniously the required fuel. for the remote island of Tristan de Cunha, where a warm welcome awaited them.
Uh, the ship's on its way from, it has to stop in Cape, Cape Town. Town, yeah. So, uh, it's probably not too far away from Cape Town at this point. Yeah. And then, uh, we figure we're here for at least five days. With a minimum five-day wait, there was no choice for the Puma boys but to kick back, relax, and enjoy life Tristan style. Casey had a 41, Emo had a 43, and Rome typically either birdies or loses his ball. I like can see that. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. <laughs> Cape Town was in sight for the leading boat of the Volvo Ocean Race Fleet, providing a suitably stunning backdrop for the climax of their adventure. A delighted Team Telefonica charging through the waves at full speed on their way to a spectacular Leg One victory. For me, it's a great feeling. This is the first regatta I've sailed as a skipper, and it's a huge responsibility. I think everything has gone well. We have a great machine, and it's run smoothly and quickly. And that's down to the enormous amount of work the team has put in. It's a magnificent result and reflects the great work everybody has done. said from the start just fell together you know just every decision we made was semi right and <laughs> didn't make any bad ones any clangers so uh, yeah we just uh, did what we uh, do what we do and uh, go out there and so I was a bit, a bit sad that three boats retired um, but I don't think that affected the way we sailed at all we just sailed to win and we're super happy. The truth is, there's no better way to fight for overall victory than winning the first leg. The boat worked really well, as have the team. Everything went really well. I'm very proud of all of them. Happy to be home. Good. Of the friends and family and the dentist. It was a rough ride into port for Camper with Emirates Team New Zealand, 16 and a half hours behind Telefonica. Second place in the opening leg, a result they would be more than happy with considering their strategic error at the beginning of the race. Points, like I said, really, you know, couldn't be happier in regards to our points and our position overall, given what we feel um, we have to improve. Like we have, a, I feel we have a lot to, a lot more to give than what we than what we gave on leg one. Okay, so we've arrived. It was quite a tense finish because of the wind, so it was quite tricky. But we're happy we've finished. It was a long leg and a bit nerve-wracking because we had Camper behind us. So we've finished in third and we're on the podium. So it's just great. And now we'll make the most of it all and party all week. Don't worry. As for Group Armour, Lady Luck had left the building. 
Stalled by light conditions, the French boat eventually sailed into Cape Town almost three days behind the leg winners. But that need not be a cause for concern. As leg one has proved beyond doubt, anything can happen in the Volvo Ocean race. For the remainder of the fleet, repairs and recovery were well underway. A new bow section for Team Sanya was completed and ready and waiting when the damaged boat arrived in Cape Town. Time is now of the essence for the Chinese team. Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing also arrived safe and sound via container ship, and their schedule should allow the team sufficient time to tune up their replacement rig ready for leg two. And as for Puma, help was on the way. The cargo ship Team Bremen headed out to collect the stranded yacht and sailors from their unscheduled holiday on the island of Tristan da Cunha. All being well, she will be back in port on December 6th, just four days before the Cape Town import race. A tight turnaround? Without doubt. An impossible task? Only time will tell.